Go. Okay, good to go. As Joanne said, uh, my name is uh, Don Schockner, Conservation Police Officer or Game Warden. Uh, I've been here in Monroe County probably going on roughly 15 years. Uh, prior to that, I was in uh, deep southern Illinois, uh, down in Alexander and Pulaski County, down by uh, Horseshoe Lake down there, uh, Olive Branch, that area down there. Uh, very, very interesting place, but uh, this is a little bit closer to home, so came back up this way. Um, as I go along, if you have questions about something, please feel free to ask. Uh, I found typically when uh, people ask questions, there's it's impossible to cover everything, and usually it'll open the door to something that uh, I forgot to mention or anything else like that and bring up some good, interesting stuff. Um, the title of the talk is Hunting for Conservation. Uh, probably more of it will be, will be about uh, my job duties. Uh, I gave it some thought because I wanted to convey, I guess, uh, primarily the, I guess, the, the funders and sort of the movers and shakers as far as wildlife conservation goes uh, as being hunters. Uh, you see a lot of stuff on TV nowadays and in the news and everything else, and uh, as our society becomes more and more removed from nature, uh, people have less and less of a realistic or practical view of nature. Um, you know, you see stuff like uh, the incident where the the lion was shot, I forget what country it was, and they turned that into basically an international uproar and when you know the dust settled, everything was legal as far as that goes. But you know, that was a that was a one particular animal that was looked at as uh, I, I guess I, iconic uh, to some of the people in the area or something like that. And uh, and it raised a big stink, but nobody said anything about the dollars that were spent by that hunter and hunters like him that actually support the wildlife in, in those countries. Uh, when you look at, uh, you know, Zimbabwe and basically all the countries in Africa that have any sort of legitimate professional hunting program, that is one of the things that literally ensures that that wildlife, for their citizens, they have a reason for that wildlife to continue. Uh, otherwise, it's similar to early America where it was looked at either as a food source or a nuisance. You know, wipe it out, knock it off, get it out of here. Um, and so it rarely comes up, I think, in, you know, in, our, in our commercial media, uh, the value that hunters play as far as the conservation of our wildlife. Um, and I wasn't sure how I could really convey that all that well, so uh, primarily my slides are some of the different organizations, and I just tried to touch on some of the highlights with those organizations just to give you a feel for what they do. Um, these are all hunter-based uh, conservation organizations. They're all nonprofits, with I, which I think is uh, very important to note. Uh, and if you dig into them at all, you start looking at uh, how their dollars are spent and everything else like that. Their numbers, almost all of them, are upper 80s or mid 90s as far as actual money that they take in that's actually spent on conservation type stuff, uh, which a lot of nonprofits, you know, sometimes they have a bit more overhead. And I felt like even though that's not something that really, it, it shows more concretely, I think, uh, the intent behind their organizations as much as anything. This isn't just some big money-making organization where they can pay a, a director, you know, two or three million dollars to, uh, to do something. They're about getting the concrete stuff done. So, one of the, let's see, um, basically, uh, wildlife persists in the United States of America primarily because of hunters. Uh, starting off, you look at the term conservation. It simply means prevention of wasteful use of a resource. You can break it down, just wise use. I tell that to kids every time I'm in a hunter safety course. A lot of people don't know what the term conservation really means. Uh, and it's essentially sustainable use. Uh, if there's, if a habitat can support 500 deer and you can remove 200 deer, 250 deer from that habitat every year, and that population can sustain itself, resustain, continue to sustain itself, well, that's a wise use. You're going to have that there forever and ever as long as, you know, something doesn't change in that equation. Um, so if you see, I've got a number of different critters mentioned up there, passenger pigeon, bison, waterfowl, bighorn sheep, elk, pronghorn. Uh, all of those, with the exception, I'll talk about the passenger pigeon later, but all of those were literally in severe danger of being wiped out in the United States. Uh, 
pretty much by the, uh, the late 1800s, uh, things were rapidly declining downhill. Uh, the passenger pigeon in particular, uh, it's believed that at one time the passenger pigeon was one of the most populous species on the earth. Billions and billions of birds. Uh, no seasons, no limits, no methods, no hunting hours. Everything was just fair game. Uh, when you read stories about them, they, they used to literally roosting in trees and stuff like that. They'd break, break large branches. So many tree, birds would roost in the trees. People could go up. They, apparently, they were a relatively dense bird, for lack of a better way to put it. Uh, they could club them, go up there at night when they're roosting, and just simply club them off the branches. Uh, and it was... I think uh, some of the attitude, yes, you know, yes, they were, you know, they were being eaten and shipped off to markets and different stuff like that. But there was also the attitude of, uh, kind of the idea that you'd have, you know, shoot clay pigeons in the backyard. You know, I'm not going to go pick up the pieces. I'm just having fun. Uh, and literally, they're extinct. Not a single one left today. I mean, you're talking from billions. Uh, you know, you just look at a flock of blackbirds that flies over nowadays. You know, it might be a flock of 10,000 birds. It just seems, you know, absolutely immense. Well, you know, picture a flock of billions, you know, where they literally darken the sky. Uh, and we wiped them all out. So uh, at the, about the same period of time there, uh, you know, bison or, you know, the American buffalo, that pretty much went from millions and millions and millions uh, down to literally just a handful. Uh, you know, by the late 1800s, it was, uh, it was at that point. Uh, waterfowl was going the same way. Bighorn sheep, elk, pronghorn. Uh, pronghorn have gone from, I think they're down to about 12,000 to over a million nowadays. Uh, and the big, I guess, the, the big, big push for this, uh, Theodore Roosevelt is one of my favorite presidents. Uh, man, the guy got stuff done. Uh, he was an ardent hunter, conservationist. Um, and from the work that he did and kind of the things that he pushed, uh, we have what's called the North American model of wildlife conservation, which is two fundamental principles. They're just very, very basic. Basically, all the fish and wildlife belongs to all of us. And until somebody legally takes that through a method that's legally allowed, it doesn't become your private property. Um, no one can uh, basically exploit it for commercial gain. That's what was taking place, you know, in the late 1800s. You know, they go out there with the buffalo. Uh, if you ever drive... Nebraska has, I forget the name of the fort, but they've got a picture of a uh, soldier standing next to a row of buffalo skulls. It's 12 feet high, 12 feet wide, and runs for like three-eighths of a mile. And it's nothing but the skulls. Uh, and it was a situation of, well, well there's, you know, there's tons of it. You know, we'll never run out, you know, to the point where literally all they were taking from them was the tongues and the hides. Uh, you know, Make a dollar, make a fast dollar, go, go, go. Uh, so that was one of the things. The same thing was happening with waterfowl. Um, I don't know if any of you read any, uh, you know, any of the, there's, there's various, I wouldn't call them novels because a lot of them are true, true stories or as true as they can be. Uh, but there's one in particular, there's a, uh, I probably shouldn't single them out, but there's a family up on the Illinois River, uh, waterfowl hunters that were basically big time poachers. Uh, and one of them wrote a book on their poaching exploits. And uh, I guess one of the things that helped <clears throat> to change that particular hunter's mindset a little bit, I wouldn't call him a hunter, a poacher, uh, mindset a little bit, they used to market hunt and sell stuff at the market and everything else like that. Uh, one particular evening, uh, they knew it, extremely cold weather had set in, so everything was icing over. So. Uh, ducks were heavy in that area, and if they don't migrate, then they're going to concentrate on the water holes that are still open. So they went at night to this one particular slough, a long, narrow slough, him and I think it was two other guys, and basically eased down there where they wouldn't spook the ducks, got down level with them, and then just cut loose with everything that they could. Well, the next morning, they picked up over 700 dead ducks, and he said there were easily several, several hundred more that were crippled that they couldn't recover. And that was just three guys, you know, basically one big hurrah in the evening. And, and I guess that one, I guess the waste of all the cripples is what kind of started, started bothering him a little bit. Uh, but that was not uncommon. You know, uh, if any of you have ever heard the term punt gun, 
uh, for lack of a better way to put it, it was essentially a darn cannon that you could carry with you to shoot into flocks of ducks. Uh, you see some of these pictures of the old, these old punt guns. I don't see how these guys could withstand the abuse of shooting these things. Uh, they'd have them in a small boat. Typically, they had very long barrels. Um, literally, I mean, a, a miniature cannon. The idea was just kill as many as you could. Uh, really no sport to it. It was all about the money. So then the second thing is basically uh, all wildlife needs to be managed in ways that uh, sustains healthy populations. So I mentioned Teddy Roosevelt here. Uh, about the same time that, I mean, Teddy Roosevelt couldn't have had better timing for things to happen this way. Uh, the late 1800s, people were growing more and more aware of this and realizing, uh, hey, this stuff is not inexhaustible. Uh, you know, there's a whole lot less of this, a whole lot less of that. Uh, we need to do something about it. And primarily it was uh, uh, magazines, uh, newspapers that uh, were run by sportsmen and organized by sportsmen. One in particular, Field and Stream, uh, which is still around. Uh, they were starting, to, we were starting to see more and more articles uh, basically bringing up, hey, what are we doing? Look at this. You know, there's got to be some sort of limits to this. We need, to, we need this stuff to be, uh, you know, some sort of control put on it so it will be here for our existence. Um, so uh, in 1877, Teddy Roosevelt and George Bird Grinnell founded the Boone and Crockett Club to advocate wildlife conservation and the principles of fair chase hunting. Uh, Boone and Crockett Club still exists. Uh, probably most hunters know it nowadays. It's just sort of a, a record-keeping club if you kill a really big this or a really big that. Uh, but it originated out of the ideas of fair chase. And, uh, you know, there need to be some sort of guidelines. We can't just go, uh, you know, wild cowboy on all this stuff. Uh, one year after the Boone and Crockett Club, uh, first hunting season in bag limits on birds came up in Iowa. Uh, so it was having an effect, a positive effect. Uh, let's see, Teddy Roosevelt, I mean everybody pretty much knows it, he's the founder of the National Wildlife Refuge System, uh, which before him there was absolutely nothing like that, uh, which, okay, a refuge is exactly that, you know, you think, oh, well, you know, why would a hunter want something like that? From my experience, while it seems like everybody enjoys wildlife, everybody likes wildlife, but people who are more actively engaged in the outdoors have a greater appreciation for it and a greater understanding of it. And I think that's where this came from. You know, you realize, hey, you can't, you got to have some pockets, you know, where things can remain as they are. Uh, and so, anybody have any idea how many we have now, National Wildlife Refuges? We're up there pretty good. I think it's, I could be wrong, but I think it's somewhere up around 70 or 80. Um, but there's, there's typically, there's something unique or special about that particular property that they choose to make it a refuge. Uh, you know, it's not just, uh, well, let's just draw a square out here and we'll call that a refuge. Um, let's see, another, another big, out of all this from, you know, just uh, Hunters and Teddy Roosevelt and some of this other stuff like that, another thing that came about it was the uh, Federal Lacey Act, which is still in effect to this day. Um, and I've actually written violations related to it. Uh, and basically what that is, is it eliminated market hunting. And if somebody over here in Illinois killed a whole massive amount of ducks and they want to sell them over in Sudlard Market over in Missouri, well, the moment they cross the state line, it becomes a federal violation. Um, unfortunately, the way some of our court systems work, uh, at the county level, sometimes you may not have the either the greatest prosecution or the greatest judges, or they just don't grasp it or don't understand it. And basically, it's another tool, a, uh, a, a bigger hammer sometimes for that more serious type stuff. Uh, you know, it's not not necessarily used just because some guy shoots a deer over here illegally and goes over into Missouri with it, but it's that bigger hammer that comes into, I guess, good effect <clears throat> in necessary in some of those more serious cases. All righty. Okay, uh, who pays for the bulk of wildlife conservation? Uh, certainly they don't pay for all of it, but literally, I mean, the lion's share of it comes from hunters, anglers, and trappers. Um, license fees and excise taxes. You see that first number up there, that $872,190,189 in 2018, that was simply from licenses and permits. That's the whole U.S. I mean, that's $872 million. And that's been going on pretty much ever since 
licenses have been around. Uh, you know, obviously the numbers would have been lower, you know, previous years, but uh, uh, that money, you know, it's it's basically the the bulk of what keeps most conservation departments, you know, going. Uh, in addition to that, 872 million, uh, the excise taxes, uh, 1934. Uh, well, we'll start off. I'll jump down a little bit. 1937. Uh, sportsmen specifically lobbied Congress to pass the Pittman-Robertson Wildlife Restoration Act, which is in essence just a tax on firearms and ammunition, and it's a pretty high tax, I think it's about 11%. Uh, that money specifically goes to wildlife conservation. Um, the way the, federal, the feds dole it out, uh, the amount of money that they have at the, at the end of, I guess, every tax year or whatever, then a state has to match it to a certain percentage. Uh, I don't know if back when we had Blagojevich as a governor, uh, you guys recall hearing about him sweeping some of our funds and stuff like that. Well, we were in jeopardy of losing, I think it was $18 million uh, from the feds that should have gone to us if we matched it the way that we were supposed to. Well, he swept our money and that money wasn't there. So that was money that we didn't lose it, but I think it came darn, darn close and they were very generous with holding it over longer than what they should have. Um, so... Uh, if you look at the very bottom one, oh, there's also the uh, what's called the Dingle Johnson Act. Uh, they saw how well that the uh, Pittman Robertson Act worked. So this, the Dingle Johnson, was just an act on basically fishing gear. Uh, so as of 2016, I got a number of different, a wide variety as far as the the amount of money that it has produced over the years. Uh, everywhere from 72 billion down to just a little bit below this, but. Eighteen billion dollars, billion dollars, uh, and you stop and you think about all that that has been put into. Yeah, sure, I'm sure some of it might be related to maybe some equipment for biologists here or there. But I mean, you're talking for conservation of the wildlife. There's a lot of organizations out there that I think talk the talk, but they really don't walk the walk. Um, you know, I did a little bit of poking around on some of these, some of these others that I know of them, and I, you know, know some rumors, and you know, well, do they really do much good, or don't they really do much good? The interesting thing I found with a lot of, very few of those, where you, the big names, you hear them a lot, you see them on book bags and backpacks and stuff like that, uh, but they're not nonprofits, which right away, okay, well, it's for profit. Um, and then you look at what their money is spent on. It's not spent on, hey, we purchased you know this 2,000 acres over here of prime wetland ground that's in danger of being developed or drained or this or that. You just don't see those sorts of things. Um, yeah, they do a lot of, I guess, self-promoting and quote-unquote education, uh, uh, you know, but mainly it's commercials. When you, I, it, what really amazed me when I got on and I looked at some of the conservation sites, it's what you would expect. Okay, you know, here's our mission statement. Here, here's, here's what's about us. Uh, you know, here's some of the stuff that we've done. Here's what we can do. Some of those others, because I was trying to be balanced and I thought, you know, I'm trying to be as fair as I can. You click on them. You can even click on the, here's who we are. The very first thing that pops up is donate your money, send it here. They don't tell you about themselves. They don't tell you how much money they spent on this or on that last year, or what their current efforts are, or uh, what state agencies they've worked in conjunction with. It's all about send me the money, send me the money. And I mean, I tried, I'm not, I'm not very tech savvy, but I tried, and it was incredible. I go to, okay, well here, I'll click on this, and that'll get me away from this. What pops up, boom, that very first thing, send us your money, send us your money. And you know, that, to me, that would just make me suspicious as a person of that organization you know, well, tell me what the heck my money's going to do, what you're doing with it. Um, also, uh, 1934, what's uh, called the Ding Darling Duck Stamp. Uh, basically, it was artwork to raise funds to conserve wetlands. We still, that's what the federal duck stamp is nowadays. Um, uh, it's a really neat program. Basically, uh, there's an artist every year, uh, numbers of artists, they submit their work. Uh, the feds basically have a guideline as far as what particular species they want for that, that year. And basically, the best artist uh, wins, and every one of those little stamps has their artwork, miniaturized version on that stamp. Uh, and that money goes for wetlands, goes for ducks. 
Uh, let's see here. All right, so the net, the rest of these may get a little, I don't know, if it gets a little dry, let me know. But basically, I just, I just picked a handful of organizations that I know off the top of my head. Uh, did a little bit of research on them as far as some of them, it was a little more difficult to find out exactly how much they spent. But for instance, Whitetails Unlimited. It's a hunter-based conservation organization. One thing as I go through all of these just uh, that just struck me is look at what their mission is. Almost every single one of them, the first thing is either education or habitat. And I don't know, probably half of them then said something about, you know, that was usually about the third or the fourth said something about uh, they want to continue the tradition of hunting. But primarily it was about educating the public, getting the public aware of this particular species that they're, that they're promoting or, or looking to uh, perpetuate, and it was about habitat. Uh, and it just, I don't know, to me that just said everything. So for instance, Whitetails Unlimited, their mission, they're the very first, and this is, I may have paraphrased some stuff to shrink it down a little bit, but basically the very first bullet point was educational programs, the second was wildlife enhancement and acquisition, and, and land acquisitions habitat acquisition. And the third was preservation of hunting tradition and shooting sports. They've spent $94 million on research, wildlife agency assistance, that's with other, like for instance, then maybe they get in cooperation with, uh, maybe Missouri's doing a study on a particular disease on deer or something else like that. Uh, basically, for lack of a better way to put it, it's essentially grant money that they give to the states to continue to do their job. Um, Habitat enhancement, acquisition, scholarships, educational materials, hunter safety education, anti-poaching measures. Uh, I can tell you right now, one of our robotic deer decoys came from the local Whitetails Unlimited uh, a few years back. They donated it to us. It was over $2,000, you know, and they work. So, <laughs> um, and then cooperative projects with other conservation organizations. And this is just, this is just one of them. I mean, that's $94 million right there, in addition to all that other money. Uh, another one here, Pheasants Forever, their mission statement. Dedicated to conservation of pheasants, quail, and other wildlife through habitat improvements, public awareness, education, and land management policies and programs. Uh, I believe they have roughly 149,000 members. They operate in 45 U.S. states and parts of Canada. They have over 150 wildlife biologists on staff. If that doesn't say something right there, I mean, I don't, I don't know what does. Uh, their reputation, they're known as the Habitat Organization. Uh, in 2017, they spent $17 million on conservation, habitat-related stuff. Hand-in-hand uh, -hand with that is, uh, I guess, in addition to Pheasants Forever, is Quail Forever, which I noticed you were wearing a ball cap over there. Um, so Trout Unlimited, their mission statement, to conserve, protect, and restore North America's cold water fisheries and watersheds. I mean, that's as basic as it gets. Uh, who wouldn't want that? They have roughly 300,000 members. Uh, they use best science to drive their conservation priorities. Uh, they promote strong legal and regulatory framework to protect fish and fishing opportunities. And training, educating, and building a strong community of angler advocates. Um, I can tell you, I mean, most of these organizations, but I'm a fly fisherman myself, trout fisherman. And it's surprising how many of trout fishermen that you run into, uh, I don't know, there's just something about it that catches hold of you, uh, have a very, very, very strong passion for it. Um, and nearly all of these organizations follow that same pattern. People that are out there hunting, fishing, and trapping, they're very passionate about it. But the number one thing, for the vast majority of them, is, they're going to tell you, is educate, because there's so many people out there who have no clue how nature works other than what they see through Walt Disney uh, or maybe a nature program on TV uh, and, and it just you know it just reinforces the point that I'm saying hunters fishers and trappers they're out there they're involved in it they're seeing it they're you know they're curious about this they're wondering about that uh, it just uh, just fosters that love for nature uh, let's see Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation <coughs> mission statement ensure the future of elk other wildlife, their habitat, and our hunting heritage. Look at this bullet point over there. 7.4 million acres of habitat protected and enhanced. 
7.4 million acres. Uh, this organization was started by four hunters in Montana. Uh, I forget how long ago it was. I think it was back in the early 80s. Uh, you know, we realized elk are one of the more unique creatures that need a large volume of ground. You can't just say, okay, we'll save this 100 acres over here for elk. Uh, elk travel literally drainages. I mean, they cover ridiculous distances just in the natural course of their, their existence. And what they, what they primarily decided to do was we have to protect some of these areas that are absolutely critical to the elk. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how much land you want to set aside. If, if you're missing some of those critical areas, uh, they're not going to make it. You know, I mean, you look at like Jackson Hole, Wyoming, that particular one is a wintering ground. You hear about the Boy Scouts that go out there and get to collect the shed antlers every year and make a ridiculous amount of money off of it. Well, you know, if Jackson Hole was developed, that is a very crucial wintering ground for those elk. You could say, oh, well, there's, you know, here's two million acres other of national forest over here, but you're eliminating a very important part of their habitat. Um, so they do some phenomenal stuff. Uh, just something that I noticed here, uh, also going through their stuff, uh, I didn't list it all out the way that it was, but basically eight different states, uh, some of them where the elk had been completely eliminated, uh, some of them where just the population was greatly reduced. They basically, um, through their efforts, they've also restored the elk populations to eight different states where they were pretty much absent before, or very, 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 very minimized. Uh, Ducks Unlimited, they've been around a long time. They're not the oldest one, but they're one of the oldest ones. Their mission statement, conserve, restore, and manage wetlands and associated habitats from North America's waterfowl. Um, their mission statement, to me, that I don't know, that, that kind of says it all. You know, I'll talk with hunters, I'll talk with farmers, fishermen, just the average Joe Blow, and people will say, you know, I think we're not seeing, uh, you know, just to pick a species, for instance, muskrats. I don't know, how can we don't see muskrats like we used to, you know, growing up? You know, what's, what's the issue? Or, or pheasants or quail. The number one issue, and this is, you know, I mean, I, I, could, I guess I could produce some concrete evidence, but this is just my absolute belief. The number one issue is habitat. If they do not have habitat, it doesn't matter what else you do for them. They have to have a place to live. You, you look at all of us right now. If you came home and suddenly uh, where your house was was nothing, was nothing but a dirt patch and you were told, hey, you still got to live there. You got to spend, you know, the next month through this weather there on that dirt patch. It's going to be pretty tough, you know. We create our own little micro habitats. Well, you know, Mother Nature creates it for the critters. And if... If you're not protecting it, it doesn't matter if you eliminate every coyote, every, every hawk in the sky or whatever else you think that preys upon it. They have been living, for lack of a better way to put it, you know, hand in hand or, or talon to mouth or however you want to put it, for you know, millennia and have been doing fine. But when you remove certain very important critical things such as the habitat, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in the case of muskrats, you know, I, I was reading about a study sometime back where... Uh, uh, you just don't see them like you used to. And a muskrat, I mean, they're a rodent. They, they repopulate very, very quickly. You used to see them in every little ditch that held water. Uh, and I was reading about a study up in northern Minnesota, and I think it was just simply 32 muskrats in it. And of the 32, 31 of them, uh, you know, after they did studies on their organs and everything else like that, had ele elevated levels of, I forget what the particular, uh, whether it was pesticides or herbicides or whatever it was, to the point where it imp impacted their reproduction. 31 of 32 muskrats. Well, yeah, it's pretty tough, you know. Um, and when you tie that in with habitat, from my experience, you know, I've kind of jumped from ducks to muskrats here, uh, the only places I see any significant amounts of muskrats are either, or primarily, either very well recreated wetlands that don't have a tremendous amount of farmland drainage to them, or their natural wetlands that have somehow managed to, you know, survive getting filled in. Uh, and that's where you'll see muskrats like it used to be years and years and years ago. Uh, you know, I'm just drawing my own conclusion. Uh, okay, they're not getting, you know, wetlands are phenomenal filters, insanely phenomenal filters. And, you know, a lot of these are in areas where there's not quite as much farmland around them, so the combination of the two, well, it's probably all that stuff is getting filtered out. The environment's taking care of it. Uh, you know, to where those muskrats can reproduce like muskrats reproduce. So anyway, back to Ducks Unlimited. Uh, talk about the habitat. 
14,478,372 acres of habitat conserved since they've been around. 14 million acres. And when you consider it's primarily wetland type stuff, I mean, we don't have wetlands at all like we used to. So 14 million acres is phenomenal. Uh, they've been around since 1937. The total, and this number is even, even more mind-boggling, because they, they work with different agencies, different organizations, and, you know, get uh, basically, uh, I can't think of the term, but basically where you have, uh, like, not necessarily conservation easement, but different stuff like that. The total acres that Ducks Unlimited has influenced or conserved in North America, 191 million acres. I mean, talk about put your money where your mouth is. They definitely, uh, definitely do it. Um, National Wild Turkey Federation, their mission statement, is dedicated to the conservation of the wild turkey and the preservation of our hunting heritage. I can personally say, when I was growing up, I don't think I saw my first wild turkey until I was about 15 or 16 down in southern Illinois. Um, one particular biologist, our, our, our turkey biologist, uh, he managed to kind of his career sort of spanned the time of where we essentially didn't have any turkeys to now where we pretty much have them across the state. And the population fluctuates. Uh, there's various factors that influence them a little bit more, a little harder than others. But, I mean, even in my own lifetime, I can say, yeah, we went from basically nothing with the turkeys to, wow, yeah, you can go out and you can turkey hunt them pretty regular. I think we've done this state, what, the 70s or this county, I mean. That was like in the 70s, late 70s? As years, far as like the first, the first season on them? As far as, oh, no, as, no, when they introduced them here to Monroe? No season, yeah. It yeah. Was in the, believe me, uh, early or mid to uh, late 70s. Yeah, this would have been. introduced them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and yeah. and it was, there was a lot of belief, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting how, uh, if you don't have the biologist or somebody dedicated to studying that animal, uh, you can have what's kind of considered, I guess, common knowledge or just, uh, you know, the thought process of the day. And the thought process was turkeys can't make it if they don't have tons of big mature timber. And actually turkeys do pretty well with, a, with, a, with an equal mix of, of, of everything. That's what they do best. Uh, you go to places like Kansas, where Kansas doesn't have any trees to mount to anything, and those turkeys still do perfectly well there. Um, but uh, they were a big part of it. They have chapters in all 50 states. Uh, their goal, I was a little, I wasn't able to figure out what they've done, but this, this is what their, I think this was their stated goal for this particular uh, time period, was to conserve or enhance 4 million acres uh, since 1985. 488 million to conserve wildlife habitat and preserve the hunting heritage. 488 million. That's just from the pockets of people that believe, you know, hey, I want to see turkeys. Uh, and one of the one of the factors they had included in their uh, on their on their page was 6,000 acres of habitat is lost every day. Uh, so 6,000 acres of habitat is lost every day. Currently, less than 10% of population in the United States hunts. And their point of that was, they're just simply from their perspective, the, the funding, the money is, is drying up, so to speak. It's not going to be there forever. Uh, you know, and it, I'm not, not sure what the answer is. I mean, you look at these organizations, the phenomenal amount of good that they do and the education that they try to do, uh, but more and more of our society, you know, is not rural. Uh, and living out in the country, you have a tendency to pay attention to that stuff more. You know, you live in the city, I guess you see the pigeons and feral cats and different stuff like that, but uh, uh, unless somebody's got that real strong fire in them uh, for nature, you know, it's, that introduction is very important. So they were just bringing up that point, hey, something's going to happen, we're getting close to a tipping point. Uh, wild Sheep Foundation, mission statement, enhance wild sheep populations, promote scientific man wildlife management, and educate the public. Um, as of 2011, even though they were not a, they haven't been around terribly, terribly long, uh, they raised 74, spent 70, raised and spent 74 million on programs benefiting wild sheep, other wildlife, and their critical habitat. Uh, they got programs in 17 states, five Canadian provinces, Mexico, Europe, and Asia. Uh, and one of the things that they're strong about also is disease research. Uh, sheep are real susceptible to a number of. Uh, Oddball diseases that can, you can have a perfectly healthy population over here on this 
mountain range or whatever, and next thing you know, they're down to practically zero. Uh, so they work pretty strongly with the with various uh, uh, conservation departments <coughs> in the states that they're in. Uh, Safari Club International, they're more of a, I mean, they're still home-based in the U.S., but they kind of reach out even bigger and farther. Uh, their mission statement, protect freedom to hunt and promoting wildlife conservation worldwide. Uh, they support legal and ethical hunting based on the concepts of science-based sustainable use. Uh, they operate in U.S., Canada, Mexico, and Europe, and there was a whole smattering of other countries. Uh, millions, literally, I, I wasn't able to get a concrete number on their money, but it's a bunch. Millions of dollars raised that's been used for local conservation programs, anti-poaching funding, um, and I think primarily their anti-poaching funding has been in basically places uh, you know, like Africa and everything else like that where it's on a scale that we, we can't fully grasp, um, and education and humanitarian activities. Um, and then I'm, I think I'm down to just a couple more here. Delta Waterfowl, they've been around since 1911. So they formed not too long after that. Their mission statement, to produce ducks and secure the future of waterfowl hunting. Short and sweet. Uh, I'm sure you all are familiar, familiar with Aldo Leopold, uh, pretty much the father of uh, modern game management. Um, the individual that kind of started Delta Waterfowl uh, uh, basically got Aldo over, and that was to, they started a waterfowl research facility. Uh, basically have some concrete information for what can we do to, uh, to improve things here. So he played a big part in it early on. Uh, their focus is leading edge research. Uh, they use a ton of graduate students, uh, a lot of scholarships, different stuff like that, and it's on waterfowl and the best way to manage waterfowl. They're not so much focused on the habitat uh, like Ducks Unlimited is, but on how to keep the ducks, for lack of a better way to put it, uh, effective at nesting and reproducing. Uh, with the way our habitat is nowadays, many times it's much more fragmented, uh, they're much more susceptible to predators, and so they're looking at ways primarily of how to uh, overcome that. Uh, fur bear is unlimited. I mean, you can pretty much pick darn near any critter out there, and it seems like there's an organization for it. Uh, they're on the smaller scale, but their mission statement, improve knowledge, inform, and educate the public about fur bear species, restoring, wide, oh, restoring them, wise use, scientific management of the fur bearers, and education and conservation and habitat. Uh, last year they raised uh, $31,000, just over. Uh, they issue a lot of grant and scholarships, uh, college students uh, who basically are aimed in that direction as far as the uh, type jobs. They provided financial assistance to, this was just last year, they provided financial assistance to Montana Game and Fish Game Fish and Parks, U.S. Forest Service, Purdue University, Alaska Fishing Game, Iowa DNR, Iowa State University, Ohio Division of Wildlife, West Virginia University, Wisconsin DNR. Some of those projects were related to uh, studies, in the field studies, or uh, university related type studies, uh, beaver, otter, pine marten, bobcat. Uh, and this, I mean, I believe this completely. Uh, no other segment of society has contributed as much to the conservation of wildlife as hunters have, and they continue to do so. Money raised and spent by hunters have maintained and or enhanced millions of acres of wildlife habitat for literally thousands of species, the majority of which are not hunted, fished for, or trapped. Yes, when you look at the titles and the names of these organizations, Whitetails Unlimited, I guarantee you the vast majority of their members hunt whitetails. You know, Ducks Unlimited, so on and so forth. But, as I said before, what comes along, you preserve a chunk of wetlands because you're interested in ducks. The side benefit of that is everything else that needs those wetlands. Whether you're talking about insects or, you know, uh, <coughs> habitat uh, manipulation that they use for pheasants and quail, you know, benefiting monarch butterflies, uh, you name it, thousands of other species benefit from that. Uh, you know, so it's very easy to say, oh yeah, you're just, you know, you just put your money into Ducks Unlimited because you like to shoot ducks. But yeah, but that money's helping, you know, literally tons of other species that I don't shoot, that I don't hunt, that I just like to see and be out there. Um, so I felt like this was the best way maybe to, like, show some concrete evidence of it. Uh, and that's about it. The rest will be, I'll just talk about my job duties. Yes? 
Um, he used to manage natural resources for the Air Force. Yeah. And um, with the couple things, with the elimination of wolves and such, I mean, hunters and unfortunately cars are kind of the primary predators for deer these days. And in and, and places, their populations are such that they're decimating natural yes. um, native plant species yep. and such that they, they overeat. Yes, things. go to Kogi Mount. Um, but you can see it there. I don't know if you even know that one thing, that another thing that the Lacey Act did was um, create or authorize basically the Fish and Wildlife Fund on DOD installations where there is hunting on um, DOD installations that have adequate land to be able to support such. And similar to what you were saying, those fees and such turn right around and they can be used directly by the bases um, for um, management of that particular management of natural resources. And it, it, it is primarily the the, the military. Uh, well, it's hundred percent the military. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because they just I, I was not aware of that tie in with the Lacey Act, uh, but I don't know. It's probably been maybe ten years now, but uh, Scott Air Force Base and uh, you know the associated public airport with it. Uh, they didn't have any hunting out there. I mean, there's some serious ground down there, and uh, uh, one of our, you know, our game warden that was in that county, he got in with the biologist and got to talking to them because they had problems with, you know, deer being on the runways and everything else like that. And he's like, "Well, you don't allow any hunting on any of this property. You've got a gazillion acres. You know, deer are going to be on the runway." So that was that was something that just a little bit of common sense and they managed yeah. it. But yeah, I was not aware that. That's where that's we've interesting. Um, spent quite a bit of time trying to, uh, because I was at the headquarters at Scott, so not with the, on Scott per se. Right, So yeah, right. trying to get but their, still, yeah, kind of behind their, the scenes, their integrated sort of. natural um, resource management plan to include things like being able to hunt on Scott. The Fish and Wildlife Funds would not apply to Mid-America, it's because it is 100% DOD. Um, but obviously the deer are going back Right, to right, utilizing both of them. Yeah, well that's yeah, interesting. Yeah. That's neat, that's neat to know. Um, any, anything else related to uh, any of this? Uh, one other thing I just wanted to push, and uh, I've been a member of most of these organizations at one point in time or another, and, and I just wanted to push, look them up, research them, and see what they do. They do a lot of good, they really do. Um, there's a lot of other organizations out there that claim that they do, uh, but I'd like to see it in concrete. I'd like to see, you know, like to see it myself. So I encourage any of you guys, look them up. If there's one that strikes your fancy, join them. You know, even if you just join them for a year, it's like 35 bucks for most of them. Um, you know, so uh, take a look at them and uh, and be a part of it because uh, I forget which one it was that pointed out that basically I think it was Wild Turkey Federation. And at some point in time, you know, that money's going to start dwindling as you have fewer and fewer people that are dedicated to that. Um, you know, and you take any one of these species, it seems like most people will have one or two species that just get under their skin that they just absolutely love and uh, can't hardly, uh, you know, can't hardly stand not to, not to get out there when the seasons are in and everything else like that. Uh, but you develop a whole greater appreciation. Uh, you start looking at all this, the variety that we have. Um, all right, well, uh, as far as job duties, uh, I could probably talk all day on that, too. Uh, just to give you a kind of a general background on us, um, uh, our official title is Conservation Police Officers. Uh, we've been known as Game Wardens pretty much ever since we came into existence. We've been around since 1885, so right about the time when uh, uh, all the wildlife was taking a major nosedive, uh, they saw, okay, we need to start throwing in some laws and we need some people to enforce that. So our primary job duty is to focus on the enforcement of all the laws related to the outdoor natural resources. Uh, we have full police powers. I can do anything any other law enforcement can, officer can do. Um, but I mean, typically, unless somebody's doing something really dangerous or foolish on the, on the highway or interstate or something like that, I'm not going to be running radar or pulling people over. Um, we're also deputized federally as uh, federal game wardens, uh, depending upon the laws that are involved, uh, the species that are involved, uh, circumstances. 
Um, we also have, as far as law enforcement goes, we have extra authority uh, related to the natural resources as far as our powers of entering, examination, uh, and search and seizure. So, uh, you know, you hear people say, oh, well, the game warden can go to your house and go through your freezer. Well, that's, that's wrong there. It's, it's nice to have that rumor out there, but that's not, <laughs> that's not true. Uh, your, your home is your castle. That's still sacred ground. Uh, without somebody's permission or without a search warrant, we can't just walk into your house because we want to. But we can pretty much go anywhere else. Um, it's not something, it certainly is not something that we abuse, uh, but literally it's in law. We can enter all lands and waters to do our job. Uh, they also specifically mention everything from uh, camps, outbuildings, you name it. Um, but it's not something that we do just because we have that power. We recognize, yeah, that's pretty significant, and this is America, and you don't want to stomp all over people. So unless I have a really good reason, really good evidence, uh, you know, I'm not going to be uh, rifling through your sheds or anything goofy like that. Um, we, uh, uh, so it, as a general rule, there's not a lot of us. Uh, right now we have roughly, I think it's like 74 field officers. Uh, fortunately, finally, they just hired two more classes, so we have 38 officers in the works, but it'll be, uh, for one group, it'll probably be six months before they get out to the field, because as they finish up their training, the other group will be ready for basically a year. Um, but on average, there's about one of us per county. Um, I'm the, my home county here is Monroe County. Uh, you, you get a county that basically is your home county that you're assigned to. You have to live in that county, do your best to learn that county. Uh, learn people, learn the landowners, you know, know it inside and out. Uh, but reasonably, any given day, we're probably anywhere from a three to four county area. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, another officer being off or he's handling something else, gets a complaint over that way. Uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of ground to cover. Um, Monroe County, I think, is like 385 square miles. And when you just stop and look at one square mile, and think of how big that is, and then you know multiply that times 385. Uh, I can tell you, spent a lot of years basically trying to work around the clock, and uh, I realized you know one person can't do it. Uh, so uh, we're big, especially in our hunter safety courses. Uh, we push people. Hey, uh, you see something that's screwy or doesn't seem quite right to you? Give a call. Here's my state cell phone number. If you're wrong, no big deal. I'm not going to go and arrest somebody just simply on what somebody told me. I'm not going to go to them and tell them, hey, look, uh, you know, uh, Joe here said you're doing this. Uh, it's counterproductive. You know, I still have to do my job. Still got to be there to see it, witness it. I got to stand up in court and testify to it. I can't testify. Well, so and so told me this happened. Uh, you know, so a lot of people are worried about that. They're afraid I'm going to cause issues. They're going to fight with me. That they're not even going to know that you told me. Um, and the interesting thing is, <laughs> invariably, uh, you catch somebody doing this or doing that. One of the first things out of their mouth would be, well, who told you? <laughs> well, come on, I spend eight hours a day doing this. You know, give me a little bit of credit. Sometimes I, I do come across stuff on my own, you know. Uh, actually, I would say probably the vast majority of it. I would say probably 90% of the cases I make are from just my own, you know, grunt work. Uh, you know, the, the other 10%, I'd say, are probably from tips or somebody pointing me in the right direction or anything else like that. Um, but uh, uh, we definitely can't do it by ourselves. Uh, and one story I like to tell on myself, uh, you know, when I tell hunter safety courses, call us, call us if you know something's not right. You know, you drive home Thanksgiving, you see somebody shooting a deer out of the truck, call me. Don't tell me four days later at the gas station when you see me at the gas station. Call me at two in the morning when you see it happen. Be a good witness, you know, pick up the license plates, you know, see how many people there were, you know, who was doing the shooting, this, that, and another. Uh, I grew up. I literally, I can remember back to being four years old, my parents bought a little tiny chunk of ground in southern Illinois, which was just absolutely heaven to me. I can literally remember the first day being there. I only missed four days of high school, opening day of firearm deer season. Otherwise, I'd have had perfect attendance. And like I said, it was just absolute heaven to me down there. Invariably, firearm deer season, you'd be sitting around a campfire, telling the stories of whatever happened during that day and what we saw, whatever. We wouldn't stay up terribly late. You know, you're usually going to bed by 9, 30, 10 o'clock because you got to get up early. We'd be sitting around a campfire. There's a little bitty forest service road, ran past our place, and we went down in this big, beautiful bottoms that had a gas line cut. And probably, I don't know, 
at least every year, every other year, you'd be sitting there talking, 9 o'clock at night, boom, you'd hear somebody down there in that gas on cut. And we would just sit there and curse them. None of us ever bothered to figure out who our local game warden was. None of us ever bothered to call the tip hotline or report it or anything else like that. We just sat there and we cursed them from afar. And, you know, them no good SOBs can't even do it right. But we never made the effort, you know. And when I got this job, I realized, yeah, you can't possibly know everything. You can't possibly be everywhere all at once. Uh, and it requires basically, you know, all of us, all the concerned people to basically step in. And a lot of people are afraid to. They don't want to cause issues. Uh, there have been very, very, very few occasions I've ever seen or heard of any, any sort of issues coming out of it. And one of the things for people that are truly concerned about it that I tell them is, at this point in time, once I've made the arrest and everything else like that, if there's something crucial that they saw or something that they knew or whatever, if this person suspects you out of the blue and wants to come up and badmouth you and chew you or whatever, you're a witness to this. You're protected. Whether they're committing a felony if they come up and they threaten you or do anything else. You know, when you look at the grand scheme of things, and if I have somebody that I suspect, you know, I catch them doing this or that, and boy, the so-and-so that no good SOB told you or whatever like that, I'll just flat out tell them point blank. You go and you try and cause any conflict with them, and guess what? You just stepped into a lot, lot worse situation. Uh, you know, and I guess it's human nature to expect conflict out of it or whatever, but we rarely see that. Um, just a basic on kind of how the process is becoming a game warden. Uh, fill out an application, goofy complicated application, send it up to Springfield and uh, at some point in time when they decide to do some hiring they'll call you. Uh, it's a written test which I was very pleased to see when I took it, I mean that was 20 years ago, but when I took it uh, I would say easily 80% of it was biology related. Uh, before I got this job, I mean, I, you know, I thought I knew what a game warden did, but I wasn't quite so certain. And uh, when I took that test, that just like that was a great relief to me. I'm like, okay, it's about the outdoors. It's not just about police work and stuff. Um, so there's written test, uh, physical fitness test, a psychological test and examination, which was just ridiculous. It was like 3,000 questions. It took like five hours. Uh, and then you got to speak to a psychologist. Uh, uh, medical exam, uh, background interview, and I'm talking like all the way back to your kindergarten teacher type stuff. Uh, they're pretty thorough about it. They dig up everything. Uh, surprise interview, you know, just come home from work one day and uh, uh, here's the game warden at my house. He's been talking to my wife for the last hour and a half and now he wants to talk to me. And you know, got some questions about this or that that I dug up. Um, and then there's also a panel interview and, you know, when you finally get accepted the job, uh, then it's a matter of you go through basic police academy, the same as any other law enforcement officer in the state of Illinois. Uh, it's a 480-hour academy, so uh, basically uh, I think it comes up to six or seven weeks. I think it's a little bit longer now. Um, once we get done with that, then we go through our own DNR academy, uh, which uh, uh, about the same amount uh, once you graduate from both those academies. Then they turn you loose in the field for field training, which consists of you start off with an officer and it's a minimum number of work days. So say half your day is spent in court or something, uh, sitting there or whatever, that's not considered a work day. They wanted to be in an enforcement day where you're actually out there in the field. Um, so uh, you're with that first officer and you're doing roughly 25% of the work. Literally everything you do, you get done checking a couple of fishermen, get back to the truck, sit down, Hey, here's what you did good, here's what you did bad, here's what you need to pick up on. I notice you keep doing this every time, you know, you're going to have to pay attention to that. It's very, very, very good training. Um, second officer, you go to a completely different officer, you're doing roughly 50% of the work. Go to, after you finish that stage, you go to a third officer, you're doing roughly 75% of the work. And then your last stage, you go back to the original officer that you were with, he's in plain clothes, and you're doing 100% of the work. He's right there with you, but when you walk up to somebody, boom, focuses on the uniform. Um, and it's very, very good training. By the time you get to the end of it, you're like, all right, cut me loose. I'm ready to go. You know, Let me get done with this. Uh, very good training. And then as far as where you end up, that's just kind of a matter of how many people got hired and how many where they want people in the state. And uh, uh, with us, it would have been nice if they had done it by grades, but grades were all so close they just put <coughs> their names out of the hat. So... Uh, um, 
wow, on any given day, a lot of people, it's interesting, you know, about this time of year, people say, well, I guess there's not nothing for you to do, is there? You know, hunting season's pretty much over. Oh my gosh, no, there still is tons to do. Um, in addition to the typical hunting, fishing, and trapping that you would normally think that a game warden does, uh, combined with all the multiple species that are going on at that particular time, <coughs> typically February and March, slow down a little bit from the perspective of people out in the field. Uh, but during that period of time is when we do basically like our commercial inspections. So fish markets, taxidermists, uh, <coughs> timber buyers can be insanely time consuming. Um, and those are all more record paper type work. But they produce some very good results lots of times. Um, so we spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, this time of the year. Also, any sort of any sort of investigations that, let me back up a little bit. We are kind of a, the best way to put it is we're a one-man police force. So, you think about City of Waterloo, everything that their officers do and their officers cover. You think about, you know, the Sheriff's Department. You look at any other agency, there are multiple people handling different, different aspects of it. We're like our own little police force. So everything that my job entails, whether it's, whether it's evidence that's been taken care of, uh, whether it's an investigation, you know, I have to do something that's not just a simple matter of knocking up and knocking on somebody's door and talking to them for a few minutes, you know, more of the long-term type stuff, uh, to being out in the field, uh, to taking care of our equipment, um, to doing the uh, like paperwork type investigations. We do all that. There's not, not like I can say, oh gosh, this is going to be too time consuming. Here, I'm going to send this off to that department. No, I am that department. Uh, so, I mean, I can tell you right now, I've got a list, uh, just a backlog of stuff. I probably have about 30 different things on it. And some of them, in the course of, I, in the course of going to talk to somebody or something, you know, I've had people say, well, I really expected you would have been here about a month or so ago. Well, yeah, ideally, I, I would have liked to have been, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, sometimes you got to prioritize stuff. Sometimes you can't catch somebody at home. Uh, sometimes there's other things that jump in the way. You're in the middle of getting something knocked out that you're glad to get knocked out, and then you get an emergency call, you know, a hunting accident or something else like that. Uh, we do the investigations on the hunting accidents. Uh, so boating accidents, uh, which can be fairly complicated. But basically, everything that a regular police force does with numerous officers, basically we're doing, you know, you can look at each one of us as an individual little police force in each county. Um, so we cover everything, like I said, the generic hunting and fishing uh, to the commercial type stuff. Uh, summertime, it's more uh, parks and boating, which is a little bit more like regular type police work, uh, so to speak. Uh, we still uh, still take care of the fishing and everything else like that. Uh, this time of year also, uh, I neglected to mention, commercial fishing uh, is in the upswing, uh, which in order to be really effective at it, you have to work it regularly, uh, in, in, which can be very difficult to do. I mean, uh, you can pretty well figure if you're going to go out on, whether it's the Mississippi River or the Kaskaskia, you can pretty much figure it's going to be an all-day thing. Uh, and to just do it once, and then go back two weeks later and do it again. Yeah, you might encounter a violation or this or that, but you don't have a genuine feel for what's taking place on the river as opposed to when you're there, you know, two, three, four days a week. Um, so that's kind of something when you finally decide to do it, okay, devote yourself to it, you know, sincerely. You have to have to really get after it. Um, like I said, in the, in the parks, we run into a little bit more of the police stuff. If there's a domestic or something else like that, uh, fortunately, counties will come help us with that stuff sometimes, but uh, uh, we still get to deal with it. Uh, when I worked Southern Illinois, at that time, uh, meth was something that was just really starting to shoot up and or increase, I should say, that's poor, poor, poor use of terms. Uh, and literally, when I roll down a Forest Service road, you know, okay, I know this one dead ends here with a little loop or whatever. If I saw a vehicle, the first thought in my head wasn't, is this guy squirrel hunting? Is this guy coon hunting? Is this guy deer hunting? It was, is this guy cooking meth? Because we're essentially a one-man force. We're out there by ourselves. Uh, and uh, most of the time, I mean, you can pretty well expect, I mean, 
most of the time, help is at least 45 minutes away. Uh, so we had good training, and once you realize, hey, I'm it, I'm the Lone Ranger, I can only rely on myself, you know, you just learn to adapt to that. Um, fortunately, we don't see that as much up here, and it seems like it's kind of tipped off a little bit, but it's still one of those things. Because the nature of the job, the vast majority of people I run into are just like you and me. They're just out there recreating, enjoying themselves. Maybe they've got something wrong. Maybe they did something wrong intentionally. But overall, not too bad. You know, you can take care of business and have a nice conversation with them. But then that very next person you check might be a convicted felon, can't possess a firearm, they're wanted on a warrant. You pick them up on that, and they know they're going to jail. So it's an odd balance of trying to be officer-friendly but alert and safety-conscious also. Um, and I've also found that uh, if you get too much into the uh, schmoozing with somebody, just standing there talking or whatever, it's very easy to, okay, I check this, I check that, all right, you're good to go. You have to have the mindset of where's the violation? You know, what am I not seeing? And, and so it's an interesting balance of trying to be a good, decent person to people, basically, and at the same time be aggressive enough and persistent enough that when you encounter that more serious violation or that sneaky violator, that you will find that stuff. Um, when I first came on, it was extremely difficult for me, even, even simply checking fishermen, to open in the coolers, the live wells, and everything else like that. It just felt like a violation of privacy to me. It was very difficult to get over that. Uh, you know, and I'd, I'd be like, hey, sir, do you mind if I go ahead and check this, check that? But after a while, you realize, okay, that's part of the job. People expect that. And you'll get from somebody every now and then after you after you you know look their boat over really well or whatever they'll thank you for it They're like that's awesome that was really cool uh, man I hope you do that to everybody you know I know some folks that like to come out on this lake and yeah when the fish are biting you know they'll take their over limits you know and so you realize yeah every now and then somebody will get upset about it uh, usually for no good valid reason. Um, but the majority of people, they want that, they expect that, they, they want to know that you're doing your job and you're not letting that guy get away. Um, so that's, that's an interesting part of the job. Um, another thing with our job, like I said, we're kind of jack of all trades. Uh, interviewing was very difficult for me when I first came on, just the way I was raised and the way my God made my brain, just honest. And I just assumed everybody else was. Uh, and I learned very quickly, no, they're not. Um, and it probably took me a good eight years before I got decent at knowing how to ask people questions and where to go instead of just... Uh, one of the interesting things was, I guess, one of the things that helped teach me or bring me up to speed on it was, okay, you sit here and you watch this individual for whatever, six or seven hours while they're doing whatever they're doing. Uh, they finally either, whatever, kill their over limit or commit whatever violation it is that you suspect that they're doing. And so you go up and you make your introductions. The vast majority of people don't think that you've been sitting there six or seven hours and you can tell them whatever, the joke that he told his buddy or you know, when he went over here to go to the bathroom or whatever. Uh, and so I found out, I started using that to my advantage by sneak back to my truck and come driving in like I've never been there. You know, drive up, Hey guys, how's it going? Well, you know, when they see you, whatever it is that they had wrong, they're, they're hiding it, concealing it, whatever. And I learned to ask questions <coughs> and pay very close attention to them to see how they were reacting to them. I know for a fact this guy shot 10 mallards. Okay? So when you ask them about it and you see, their, see how they're behaving, okay, I know for a fact he's lying because I saw it happen. Okay, so what, you know, what are the little telltale clues or, or what else can I see? And... It took a number of years of that for me before I kind of got to that point, but it was, it was a kind of an interesting process, and it's actually one of the things now that uh, uh, I actually enjoy it quite a bit now because I, I know what I'm looking for and everything else like that, and it's incredible. You can walk up to somebody, sometimes without even saying a word, and right away you're like, all right, there's something wrong here, <laughs> and I'm going to figure out what it is, you know. Um, so... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, let's see, what other aspects of it? Uh, endangered and threatened species, I hate to say it, but I feel like that's one that gets under-enforced, uh, probably primarily out of a lot of officers, even ignorance. Um, 
if you uh, you know you laid out whatever two dozen critters here and asked the average person which one of these is threatened or endangered, nobody's going to be able to tell you. Uh, and the people that deal in that sort of stuff, for lack of a better way to put it, uh, like for instance, like uh, 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 you know, the reptiles are, are fairly have really increased in popularity as far as pets and stuff like that. And you get people that, just like anything else, uh, okay, here's a resource. How can I make money off of it? Uh, they certainly know what they are. Uh, and I, re I can recall a case early on that uh, one of the older officers uh, stopped a guy, and the guy had, I forget what it was, his ridiculous number of box turtles in, this, in the trunk of his car. Uh, you know, it was, I don't know, 13, 14, 15, or whatever. Oh, you know, my nephew likes them. I'm collecting them for my nephew. <laughs> And I, I, I don't recall what the results of it were, but, but the, guy, the guy was collecting them for money. He was selling them for money. They can sell those suckers over in, uh, I think it's China. I think it's China. Uh, a breeding female can sell for $6,000. Wow. They take these box turtles, they tape them up, <coughs> closed up in their shell, and ship them over there. You know, when there's that kind of money on something, yeah, people are willing to do a lot of stuff. Um, so, you know, that was, that was something early on that, you know, yeah, yeah. Sometimes people are goofy and they want to collect four or five box turtles, but then when you also learn some of the biology behind it, uh, there's different viruses. Uh, you get one box turtle that has it. You get. This is why you don't hear about box turtle races anymore. Uh, you get one box turtle that has it. You have 15 other box turtles. Guess what? You just pass it on to those other 15. Okay, the turtle race is over. Everybody, take your turtle back where you got it. You just spread it all over the county. So that's, that's one of those reasons you don't hear about box turtle races anymore. And a lot of people are ignorant of the, the parasites and the viruses and different things like that that affect so many different animals. So, you know, a, a good example right now is deer. Probably the biggest violation or the most common violation we see is baiting deer. People are like, wow, you know, it increases your odds. What's it really hurting? You know, it's good for the deer, better bones, better antlers, you know, better for doe lactating fawns, all that good stuff like that. Uh, every time I, I encounter somebody like that, I, I strongly encourage them, educate yourself on chronic wasting disease. You have it in northern Illinois. Look at what it does and how little any conservation department in the United States can do to really effectively control it. Uh, shock, I shouldn't say shockingly, but Illinois is actually kind of like the, uh, the model state for how to handle it. Uh, and DNR has caught a ton of grief about it. Uh, basically, it's, it is reduce the population as much as you possibly can where that disease is at. And it reduces the spread of it. And it's basically a stave off or hold off type of thing until somebody figures out how to control this disease. We're just doing everything we can to reduce the spread of it. Uh, Wisconsin started the very same program uh, the same time, roughly about the same time that we did. They quit after two years because they received so much grief from their constituents. They said, okay, fine, we'll throw in the towel. The prevalence of chronic wasting disease in Wisconsin's deer herd is upwards of 35%. In Illinois, it's around 1%. And yes, if you're in one of those counties that have CWD, that's a bummer, because your population is down low, and the goal is to have what they call high turnover. The longer a deer is in that environment, the greater the likelihood it's going to pick it up and the greater the likelihood it's spreading all over the place. So, you know, quality deer management and stuff like that kind of goes out the window because the goal is to reduce or eliminate that. So, we now have it just across the river in Missouri. Uh, and I try to educate people, but it's, it's surprising how many times people just look at their little pocket of life and don't think about the larger consequences of it. And it's a disease, I, I guarantee you, it'll, it'll make it across the river. We'll have it over here at some point in time. Uh, but it's not necessarily going to affect this generation as much as it will the next generation. Um, you know, so it's, it's, you know, like hunter safety course this morning, you know, sometimes students will ask, you know, why, why do you have this law? Why do you have that law? Well, sometimes it's simply for a reason like that, that unless you, you know, kind of read up and learned on that stuff, you're not going to know it. Um, or it's simply because that particular law makes it more difficult for somebody to skirt these other three laws. Um, 
Let's see. Anybody have any questions while I've been going on? I kind of. Yes, sir. Armadillos are fair game any kind? Yeah, they are. They yeah, are. Yeah, they're not. Ready, get rid of the carcass. Then, as long as you have permission from the landowner that you're on. Any, any um, recommend, recommendation getting rid of the carcass? Bury it or, uh, or uh, dispose of it in uh, you know regular trash pickup. Uh, I would say bury it's probably best. Realistically, I mean, you, you look at like the Dead Animal Disposal Act and different stuff like that. You know, they emphasize burial and everything else like that. Uh, most of the time, if it's a landowner and they're on their own property and it's not like, here's the bus stop and, and then, you know, like dumping carcasses there or something like that. Well, coyotes and wildlife, Mother Nature cleans it up pretty fast. Usually when you bury something, it takes considerably long for it to break down. Uh, but, uh, yeah, they are definitely around. I've encountered quite a few of them. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't know, they're goofy. I've, it's gotten to the point where I can walk and I, I'm starting to recognize their sign when they're in an area and everything else like that. And, and if you're real quiet, I mean, you can walk right up to them. But to try and catch one, holy cow. You would not, you would not believe it, but an armadillo can seriously move. They can <laughs> seriously cover some ground. They do not look like it, but they can. Uh, yes? Are you the only officer with Madison County as your home county? Monroe County, yes. Monroe That's okay. Uh, yeah, I'm the only guy here in Monroe. Uh, we've got one guy in St. Clair, and we've got one guy in Randolph. Uh, our little, I don't know what you want to call it, metro area here, we're doing halfway well. We pretty much have a game warden, in at least one game warden in each county, uh, although a couple of them are gone on military leave and stuff like that. But, but I mean, when you look at 74 field officers and whatever it is, 102 counties, when I was way down south, I covered Alexander and Pulaski. Uh, the officer next to me covered Massac and Pope. Uh, the officer next to him covered two counties. And then there were seven contiguous counties along the Ohio River that didn't have a game warden in them. And it's like you can't, you know, you can't, you can't even really hardly keep up with one county to really work it effectively. And, and, you know, I mean, you can make a difference, but not the kind of difference that you want to make. I mean, when you're scrambling around like that, you're just you know, throwing water on little fires here and there. That's about it. Um, yes? Uh, what game species would you say in Monroe County is uh, the most endangered? A species that's hunted. Oh, uh, well, none of them are endangered, for that matter, right, but as right. far as... Population. Yeah, concerns about the population. For me, two. I'd say uh, quail and gray fox. Okay. Um, I don't know what the story is on quail, but they just... They've taken a nosedive and continue to take a nosedive. I mean, when I come across a, a covey of quail, I mean, I, I kind of rejoice. It makes my day. Um, and gray fox, starting, it seems like, about 10, 12 years ago, 15 maybe. Um, I've got some suspicions maybe, you know, related to bobcats and stuff like that. But uh, the gray, I mean, last time I saw a gray fox was... Whew, I bet you six years ago. Um, they repopulate very, very well, and you can find little pockets of them. Like, for instance, they like very tight, brushy, uh, nasty, gnarly type habitat, kind of similar to a bobcat. My suspicion is that, one, coyotes and foxes don't get along whatsoever. Coyotes kill every fox they can come across. They kind of occupy the same, same niche, and it's just the way the rules work. Where coyotes and wolves interact, wolves kill every single coyote they come across. Uh, but gray foxes seem to do a little bit better against the coyotes than red foxes because gray foxes will have a very small home range. It's usually thick, nasty, tights type stuff. Uh, and they could avoid the coyotes a little bit better. Um, my suspicion is that maybe with the rise of bobcats then, it was just kind of like a one-two punch on the, on the grays. Uh, but I have seen, like for instance, a guy over in Perry County on some strip mine ground, lots of rock piles. Lots of thick, brushy, brambly type stuff. Uh, and he's got a mess of gray fox over there. He trapped 14 one year. Oh. And that was, I mean, just off of it, I don't know what it was, you know, 60 acre chunk of ground. And he said there was still plenty left. So, you know, I was kind of like, oh man, you know, you were a little pocket that they were able to zoom out from. But uh, those are the two that, like, personally, I'm kind of like, mm, why isn't the department you know, doing a little bit more to see why or why not. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd say those two that I would be concerned about. Yes, ma'am. In terms of species going down and a correlation, 
on red fox, I used to see them pretty often on my property. And then four years ago, one denned under an outbuilding in my backyard. But three years ago is when a whole bunch of people on my street got literal free range chicken that they wouldn't even put in at night. And I haven't seen a fox since. I, and I think there's a very strong correlation there. Yeah, I, I tell people, you know, we have, we, have a, we have a function. If somebody has an issue with an animal, if it's a legitimate property damage or a legitimate human safety concern, we can issue, and it's not the regular season for taking that animal, we can issue a nuisance animal permit. Free range chickens, I tell people, a free range chicken is part of the food chain. You know, and if we issue you a nuisance permit because coons or coyotes or foxes are coming in and killing all your free range chickens, we're going to be issuing you that permit from now till eternity. You have to do something basically to eliminate, you know, yard pen, coop them up at night, all that different stuff like that. Um, one interesting thing I have seen about the red foxes is, I don't know what kind of time frame you want to put, but say the last six or seven years, uh, predator hunting has become much more popular, primarily coyotes. And since it's become much more popular, I see more red foxes. Uh, red foxes, they'll roam great distances, uh, so they're fairly susceptible to getting whacked by a coyote. Um, but since predator hunting and coyote hunting in particular, you know, has really upticked like the last six or seven years, I see more red foxes and I see more groundhogs. And when I was growing up, groundhogs were a dime a dozen. And then all of a sudden, boop, you just hardly ever see them. And I think that's a big part of it too. You know, the coyote population is getting knocked down into a more reasonable balance. So even if they're going after your free range chickens, if it's out of season, it's still illegal for them to be shooting them. Correct, correct. If it's a domestic dog that's killing your chickens, it's actually, you know, or your cattle or anything else like that, it's actually within, written within law, you have the right to actually kill that animal. Um, with the game, game and fish, it's DNR that has the discretion to say what you can do. And I can tell you, our poor biologists, they, they primarily are the guys that issue those. Uh, most people want to be able to do what they want to do, when they want to do it, however they want to do it. And this is a problem for me, take care of this problem. Okay, well if you do this and this and this, that will either eliminate the problem or greatly reduce it. Well, I don't want to do that, you know, just, you know, so it, it's, a lot of it is education as much as anything. Um, you know, coons getting into the trash. Well, when do you put your trash cans out? Well, we just leave them out by the curb. Well, wait to put them out until the day of trash pickup, you know. Um, so, and I mean, yeah, coon numbers are ridiculous high right now, but, you know, there's some species, it's, they're so populous, like right now, coon population is just through the roof. That it's a little bit easier to be a little bit more cavalier, you know, when somebody calls up and, you know, wants one of the, a nuisance animal permit, but at the same time, it's like you're not really doing them any service by not educating them on it. All you're doing is sort of perpetuating the problem or creating a bigger problem because then the neighbor's like, yeah, I'm going to kill some too. Um, so that's probably the biggest part of nuisance animal permits is educating people. There's been some recent uh, stuff that I've read about uh, invasive pigs and stuff mm -hmm. over in Missouri. Do we have that issue here in Illinois to any extent? <clears throat> yes and no. Uh, it's an absolute nightmare. We do not want them to get started here. Um, the worst that it's gotten here, um, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight years ago, I can't keep track of years anymore, uh, Fayette County, Marion County, and Cass County, uh, there was a population of feral hogs that they estimated roughly 400 feral hogs. Like literally right at the point of if something doesn't get done, we're probably not going to be able to do it. Uh, fortunately, they were able to bring them basically down to zero, uh, which you wouldn't necessarily know it, but hogs are extremely intelligent animals, uh, and they have to be pretty unique in the way that they do it. If you remember years ago when it first came up, uh, you see a feral hog, go ahead and shoot it. Um, but then what they found was, okay, if you have you know, a sounder of hogs, five or six hogs here, one comes strolling past you when you're doing this or whatever, you may shoot and kill one of them. What happens is the rest of them, they scatter and they go out farther. And then you have them over here, you have them over here, over here, over here. 
And what they found, the most effective method is, for lack of a better way to put it, a gigantic cage trap. Mm -hmm. And if there's a dozen hogs in that group, they will not drop the gate until all 12 are in there. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's right there either with video camera and everything else like that. If there's two hogs outside of that enclosure, when they drop that gate and they catch those other 10, they said those two hogs will never be caught again. Or educated Just that dogs. quickly. <laughs> and even building those cages, they make them out of basically great big hog panels. Right. They literally build them one panel at a night. One panel a night. You know, they have whatever the, the food source is that they're drawing them in with, pilot corn or whatever, and they have to build those panels. Oh, they can't just have that whole panel with one door open and, okay, here's the food, jump on in. They won't. Um, and so probably, I don't know, 16, 17, 18 years ago in southern Illinois, we had a small pocket of them, about 40. Uh, they managed to eliminate them. And I've heard of a few other pockets. You know, that, that one that I just mentioned, though, that was the most serious. Uh, you look it up in the Smoky Mountains, it's just horrible the devastation that they do. Um, hogs are tough animals. They root. They eat pretty much anything. I think they reproduce uh, pretty good, too. What's that? They reproduce pretty good, Yes, too. they reproduce phenomenally yeah. well. Uh, they carry a number of diseases that really scare oh, the domestic industry big time. Uh, as far as you know, impacting their their uh, their domestic animals also. Um, yes, sir. What are the biggest violations that you see in this area? The biggest or the most common? Well, most common and, and most common, common is probably probably uh, baiting deer. I would say is probably the most common. Uh, beyond that, uh, fishing licenses. Uh, you know, it doesn't sound like much, but probably ten percent of people that go fishing don't get a fishing license. Um, uh, not tagging deer, or not tagging them right away. Uh, you know, I mean, I've, I don't know if I mentioned it in here earlier, or if that was in the hunter safety course, but I mean, I've, there's many times I've been out in the woods, okay, this guy just shot a deer, he doesn't know I'm here, and, okay, come on, put your tag on it. Oh, he's gotten deer, okay, I'll, I'll stay hidden, wait until he finishes his gutting, maybe he's going to tag it after he's done. Oh, he's done gutting it. Oh, he just went and got the ATV parked over here and brought it over there. Okay, at some point in time I got to, you know, call it quits on him. Sometimes it's just simply, well, I don't like to do it before I got him because I don't want the tag getting all bloody. I don't care. Put that tag on there. You know, I don't know what your thoughts are. I don't know what your intentions are. <clears throat> There's a reason the back of the tag tells you tag it immediately upon kill. Um, so we see that a lot. Uh, and the interesting thing is, you know, it pays to be sneaky as a game warden. So... Uh, there are certain situations where you know what the situation was, but you didn't act on it immediately because you either had bigger things that you didn't want them to realize you were in the area, or you didn't have to act on it immediately, and then you kind of see how it plays out. And it would have been a situation many times had I just walked up on him, but face value, you know, this guy seems like a pretty good guy. Maybe I'm just going to give him a written warning. And then afterwards you're like, phew, yeah, glad I didn't. Glad I let it play out. You know, i got to see what kind of a Sportsman, he really is. Um, so, yeah, I would, I would, I would say probably that. Uh, dove hunting over limits. Uh, everybody gets their, you know, hurrah in the first week of dove hunting, and it seems like they, they feel like they should be able to kill their whole season's worth, you know, if they just want to hunt a couple of days. Um, that and baiting doves. There's a lot of baiting doves goes on. Uh, waterfowl over limits. Um, and usually guys are sneaky about it, I never about had, it. But. I never had hunt many ducks, and, but I know a lot of duck hunters. Mm -hmm. And I always wonder, how do you know? Identify how, the duck. Yeah, how can you know that that's the duck you're not supposed to shoot? The, you got the, best, the best <clears throat> way that I can convey that to you is, you've got this crowd of people here. If wife, son, daughter, uncle, best buddy of yours was in this crowd of people, would you be able to pick them out pretty quick? Yeah. And it's primarily the amount of time you spend out there seeing them. Oh. Um, you know, I tell young waterfowl hunters, go with an older waterfowl hunter that knows the birds. And when you do it enough, it's incredible. You can see birds a quarter mile away flying and go, look at that, there's two mallards. Oh, and a gadwall behind them. Oh. And <clears throat> it's that familiarity with the slight differences in the birds. Uh, you know, sometimes it's just simply their wing beats, the way that they're flying. Um, you know, when you have a bird in hand, it's much, much easier, obviously, but the, the speculum, the colored part of a, 
of, of the duck is different for every single species. Uh, their bill is different on every single species. Uh, head shape, everything else like that. And so, I mean, something like, just, I don't know, probably the easiest example I can give you, pintails. Uh, if it's later in the season, pintail duck, they've got a very long neck, a very long graceful neck. And as they mature throughout the season, they develop very long pin feathers, basically tail feathers. Uh, they've got slender wings, slender neck, slender tail. When they're flying, that's why I could describe it as they kind of look like an X in the sky. You know, and to see a pintail next to a mallard or next to a wood duck or next to a teal, you know, to somebody who's been seeing them year after year after year after year, it's as obvious as can be. And when you're first starting out is when it's most difficult or if they're just a very casual hunter and they don't bother learning that stuff. You know, I tell guys, yeah, they're much easier to identify once they're in your hand, but if it's that duck you shouldn't have shot, yeah. it's worse. Um, it's, <clears throat> for all practical purposes right now, uh, there's not like any one species of duck that you can't kill at least one of. Um, so, you know, if, if somebody thought it was this and it turns out it's that, well, they can pretty well bet they're safe, but, you know, hey, you might want to be careful the rest of your hunt or let the other guy shoot, you know, if you think it's the same type of thing. So, more than anything, it's, somebody studying them, learning what the differences are, and then seeing them enough to know it. Yes? Do you know what, or if anything, the state's doing about uh, invasion uh, of the uh, Asian carp? Yeah, actually, you know, I don't know what the feds are ever going to do as far as keeping them out of Lake Michigan, but uh, right now, up in, on the Illinois River, uh, got commercial fishermen working with the fisheries biologists, and they're doing everything within their power to tremendously reduce the population that, that leading edge on the Illinois River, to keep them from growing, growing up into Lake Michigan. As far as the rest of the state, I pretty much learned to live with them. Um, there's, just like anything else, when you get a new species or an invasive species or whatever, they just climb crazy, then you'll get a crash, and then it'll level off usually. Um, and what they're seeing right now with, uh, you know, like the, the Asian carp is you're not seeing the great big giant huge ones anymore because there's so many of them out there, the competition for the food and everything else like that, uh, that they're not getting to those large sizes. Um, and at some point in time, there they have been a few situations of large die-offs. I know in Kentucky, I think they estimated some 80,000 fish down below one of the dams or whatever the a certain bacteria in the water uh, ended up knocking off a bunch of them. But it's kind of one of those things, I mean, they're, they're a big deal because they eat the base of the food chain, for lack of a better way to put it. Uh, you know, and that impacts stuff, uh, you know, like paddlefish, paddlefish are filter feeders also. Uh, so you're not seeing paddlefish get up to the same sizes that they were, you're not seeing the same numbers of paddlefish. But honestly, without some sort of natural biological control to really kick them back, Boy, there's very little that we can do really to, to really reduce the population significantly. Um, I mean, short of, you know, getting the whole U.S. on board with, mm -hmm. hey, let's eat Asian carp, which is actually, it's very good to eat. Uh, you know, it would require something like, like a commercial market to really, I think, bring it down anything reasonable. Um, that said... Don, I think uh, the Illinois Environmental Council just came out yesterday with a... a what Governor Pritzker has pointed out I'm to I'm unfamiliar with it, so. His, his, you know, number one priorities for conservation and the Asian carp was number two on that list, Good. I think, to do Good. something about it. So. You know, and all we have to do is look at the history of the Great Lakes and the different invasive species that have gotten there and the impact that they've had on them. Uh, you know, like the, the mussels and everything, the zebra mussels and stuff like that. Yeah, they've done a marvelous job of filtering the water, but there's also, you know, some serious negatives to it. You know, the, the lamprey for years, sea lampreys, that was a major, major issue there. And they pretty much, uh, those lampreys require uh, basically uh, streams flowing into the Great Lakes to reproduce. And it took quite a while, but the biologists figured out, okay, here, this particular pheromone or hormone or whatever, uh, these are headwaters that are, they need that to reproduce. Uh, you know, they can create these giant net traps and everything else like that, and they've, like, pretty much, they haven't eliminated them, but they've greatly reduced sea lampreys. And those were a big issue because, you know, they create, kill fish pretty well. Um, another one is 
uh, I'm sure you all are familiar with it. Uh, you know, his common name is Bush Honeysuckle. <laughs> it's a nightmare. It is a nightmare. Uh, I can tell you, I love to hunt in Southern Illinois, in Shawnee National Forest. You know, I've got that little piece of property down there, and it's just happened to me. Fortunately, the immediate Shawnee National Forest right around that area does not have it, but, you know, springtime and late fall are the best times to see it because it's holding that green. And I cannot tell you how many hundreds of hours I've spent pulling that stuff. <laughs> Even though I know it's going to be a hopeless cause eventually, you know, my brother-in-law and I will go down there, we'll be turkey hunting, and next thing you know, we find a patch of it growing along next to the car line or something like that, and spend three hours pulling it out, you know. It's just going to make that area last ten more years without it. Um, but, you know, that just originated simply people like different stuff, you know, native stuff isn't good enough, so, hey, you know, let's something they came, came through the nurseries, and it just, it's just taken off. Several years ago, we had a, a, a seminar called Picked Off, and there was a gentleman who had done a study over in Missouri, he had taken a cooler, filled it with dry ice, and then screwed it to a piece of plywood and put double-sided tape on the plywood and set it out into a, an area full of honeysuckle. And he got ticks galore. Yeah, the CO2 coming off. Right, right. That's then clever. He cleaned, then he cleaned all the honeysuckle out and he did the same thing. And he didn't get any ticks. Or fewer ticks, I should it's say. From and, and so his theory was, you know, that the ticks are on the honeysuckle waiting for a host to walk by. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's and I've seen that well, from you personal experience. Seen, you should have seen the ears perk up in this room. And it's not just, it's not just honeysuckle. I mean, you know, I have found like for instance, I can recall when I was a teenager one time in early summer. I I don't I don't know if any of you have ever done this. Maybe it's just odd that I do. But I kept a tick one time that was super engorged that was off my dog. Put it in a pill bottle. So I was curious. I want to know what the heck it, you know, yeah. when they have their young, how do they do this? Uh, that chick was in that pill bottle, I don't know, week, two weeks or whatever. And for lack of a better way to term, it was like it just burst open. <laughs> I have no idea what the number. 5,000? Wow. As small as you could almost see. I mean, like, imagine the, you know, the period at the end of a sentence and chop it up into four. And just thousands of them. And uh, so, of course, I left the pill bottle closed, and I thought, <laughs> I wonder how long they'll last in that pill bottle without being able to feed on anything. Um, and if I remember correctly, I think they made it about four weeks. And, uh, you know, you'll hear people talk about seed ticks or, or turkey ticks or this or that. They're basically just ticks that are in immature stages. Um, but I, I know from experience, going through the woods, uh, I guess when one of those ticks basically bursts or give birth, those young ones don't go very far from there. And uh, I encountered a clump of weeds one time, and I don't know what made me stop or why, or it was brushing against my leg and I felt something or whatever. Just hundreds of them, you know. So the first thing, of course, I did was go down to the creek and scrub myself off the sand. But uh, I think a lot of it is that it depends on, you know, where they're birth or born at, and they don't get very far from there, just wait for that host. But, you know, that's hard to say. Did somebody else? Yes. Um, this is kind of different. Do you know anything about, uh, like, where, uh, if you have extra game that you can donate it for food? That's a very good question. We, up until literally middle of first farm deer season this year, like, for instance, deer, you could donate. They had the Hunters for the Hungry program. Uh, Miller's Meat Market and Redbud participated in it. Which was a godsend to us because we'd get somebody, no matter when it was, you know, post a deer or whatever. Here you have one, two, or three deer or whatever. I don't have time to clean them. You know, I, I have in the past, and I just, I just don't have the time. You know, I can't clean them and donate them somewhere. So we could just take them there. And, but it was a program that basically the state paid the the butchers fifty dollars for every deer that they butcher up, and then that all that meat went to basically various food banks in the area. Uh, but they discontinued that, so we don't have that, and, and it's it's kind of something I need to get on the ball and find out some of our local food banks who will or who won't take stuff like that. Uh, I've got an old timer over in one of the towns that I trust. I know he's a reliable individual, uh, and he knows a number of different people 
in that area that legitimately need it. And so, you know, if we get like a over limited ducks or something like that, a uh, number of times myself and another officer will we'll brush them out, we'll clean them out, take the meat, take the meat to him, he gets it to people that need it. But as far as programs, do you no, I was just doing clarification if it was that meat market that's discontinued or if it's state of Illinois. Illinois they no longer they no longer my bet would be write our legislators on that. Right, right. And, and and the interesting thing or the interesting sad, I don't know how you want to put it, literally no notice of it whatsoever till like it was Saturday of first gun deer season and I had deer to take there. When I called them up and said, Hey, you know, uh got a couple of deer here and they're like, That's all that we can take because they just called us up and told us it's discontinued and we're not supposed to take anymore. Um, so, and I mean, that, that was a really good program. You know, that's one of the things when you look at food banks and everything else, they need meat as much as anything. You know, they just don't get that. And I mean, that's as good and healthy a source of meat, and it's, it's done through a butcher shop, so there's no issues, you know, as far as, you know, with the, the health, you know, uh, uh, health department or anything else like that. Not, no, that not for human consumption, but Treehouse Wildlife was looking for Very good. Yeah. meat for them to feed their raptors yeah. and things. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, if they weren't so far away, there's a number of stuff I've been meaning to want to take up to them, but it's a pretty long drive. I'm is sorry. That program yeah. that was statewide that that ended? Yes, it, but it was only if the butcher was willing to participate in it. So, you know, when I talked to uh, Miller Meat Market, he said, it costs us more than 50 bucks to do this, but it's a worthwhile program, and you know we want to participate. So, it doesn't have so some butchers didn't participate in it because they, they just didn't want to. But it was a, it was a program that was open to pretty much any any butcher in the state if they wanted to be involved in it. Um, I wanted to go back to the early in the conversation. Yeah, go ahead. That's fine. So. You know, the money's not going to last yeah, forever, all these donations to the organizations right. and stuff. So that's right. not right. And everybody says that the hunter numbers are declining. Right. I've hunted everywhere. I raised and trained coon hounds for over 20 years. I've awesome. competition hunted across the country. I deer Maybe hunt in several states. I don't see those numbers going down. Is it just yes. me? No, what I think it is, is in relation to the pop total population. Okay. So, you know what I mean? If there's 10 people and one of us hunts, and then there's... 20 people and two of us hunt. You know, it's it's not keeping up with. If if I had to, you know, I'm I'm kind of making an assumption here, but I think the percentage in relation to the total population. So as the population in the United States continues mm -hmm. to jump up, fewer and fewer people are rural, more and more larger and larger cities. The percentage of hunters versus the population is continually declining, mm -hmm. and as we get more and more people. For lack of a better way to put it, things get more costly, more difficult to accomplish because more and more people are, you know, taking occupying space. Right. You know? Yeah, I get that. It seems like uh, just looking back, so hunting with my old bear white tail two and giant double X seventy five arrows, it seemed like I was the only one out there, and now it seems like everybody and their brother bow hunts. Well, I'll, I'll agree with you there. I mean, it's you know, I was born in nineteen seventy two. I didn't hunt until deer hunt until I was twelve years old, but it was the biggest deal in the world for me in grade school to go, my yeah. dad got a deer, my right. dad got a deer, right. you know, or just, you know, and that was just, it was, it was unusual. And I, I mean, I can even remember, you know, my first, first year's hunting, it was something just to come back and say, I saw a deer. Mm -hmm. uh, right. You know, my dad told me when he was a kid, he used to rabbit hunt, quail hunt, you know, that was, that was the thing to do then. And he distinctly remembers the first time he ever saw a deer track and he came back and that was like the talk of everybody he knew, yeah, right. just simply because he saw a deer track, you know. So, you know, as the deer population increased, I think the availability and the possibility of hunting them increased. So then more and more people took that up. Um, you know, and you could look at the inverse, how many rabbit hunters and quail hunters do you know now? Right, right. You know what I mean? Because, the way and squirrel I mean, rabbits, oh gosh, yeah, that breaks my heart. Yeah. I, in hunter safety courses, I tell I tell the parents, take your kids squirrel hunting. They're one of our most populous species. Mm -hmm. We've got a great long season. If a kid screws up and spooks them, big deal. Five minutes later, you're going to see another one, and you can move to another tree. My boy you know? was going to come here. You speak today, but he decided to go squirrel hunting instead. Well, good, <laughs> good for him. He's only got till the fifteenth, so yeah, awesome. right. <laughs> and and you know, and that's. I also it seems to me, you know, this is just kind of I don't know, statement on society. Everybody now wants the biggest and the best immediately. Mm -hmm. 
and you know, hunter safety courses. You know, you got a whole mess of young kids in there. I ask, them, who's going to be deer hunting? Yeah, right. Who's going to turkey hunt? Eh, maybe about a third to half. Who's going to squirrel hunt? You might get one or two or three hands. And you know, it's how can I put it? I feel like people, the the harder you have to work at something, and the more legitimately you have to work at it, the more you truly appreciate it. And so when you have that build up, oh, I can't tell you how excited I was to get to go deer hunting my first time. You know, oh my gosh, we get to actually go deer hunting. You know, but I've been squirrel hunting a ton. Wasn't and, allowed to go deer hunting until you've been squirrel hunting and rabbit hunting. And that's and that's kind of the way I grew up. Okay, I got to tag along with mom and dad. Then I got to take the BB gun. Had to treat it like it was a real rifle or a real shotgun. If I did something stupid or foolish with it or dangerous or unsafe, uh, okay, gets taken away from you for whatever period of time until you get your head straight. Uh, and, and you like you graduate up to it. You know, I, how many kids start out driving NASCAR? You know, that's that's kind of the way that's kind of the way I, I put it. You know, and and I cringe a little. You know, when I see an article on a kid, you know, that's ten or eleven years old and he just killed a bighorn sheep or you know a grizzly bear or something else like that. And it's kind of like, yeah, that's a really cool experience for him, but I, I feel like you're doing them a disservice because you're not letting them learn the way up to that point to where they know what it is to truly appreciate it. Um, you know, but it's just, I don't know, it's just, you know, my take on things and everybody's got their kids and, you know, what they want to do. So Maybe um, the, the moms don't want to uh, cook the squirrel. I'll tell you what, <laughs> this is very funny, this is very funny. I squirrel hunted a ton as a kid. And I ate squirrels, but I didn't like them. And then when I got older, and I fixed them myself, I was like, I'll be darned, I do like squirrels. All my mom, all she ever did was apple or chicken, squirrel and dumplings. Oh. And however she fixed it, I didn't care for it. <laughs> so I just thought squirrel didn't taste that good. And then when I was able to start making it myself, I'm like, no, it actually tastes pretty darn good. Yeah. You know, but yeah, and some of it, I really like it. Like you know, I, I get a number of different hunt magazines and everything else like that. When you see an article in there, uh, and they're 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 covering either different recipes or the care of the meat. You know, I think an enormous, I don't know what you want to call it, uh, misnomer or misunderstanding, wild meat is not bad tasting. It's not gamey. Uh, it's not strong. It's not this. Unless you don't take care of it right. How many people do you know would go and buy two pounds of hamburger and leave it lay on the dash of their car in the sun for three hours? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody. But a lot of people don't think about that. You know, the most important thing with wild meat is getting the heat out of it as soon as possible. Gut that deer immediately. Don't drag it all the way back to camp, sit there and tell the story and take a bunch of pictures and BS, eat breakfast, and then gut it, you know, two, three hours later. Uh, or haul it around in the back of the truck when it's 60 degrees, you know, laying on your black rhino line to better your truck. You know, it just doesn't make sense. And I mean, I've, I've seen it personally myself. I mean, that was, we've always butchered our own. Primarily because I want to know I want to know how it's taken care of, and I know you don't necessarily get your meat back, you know, your own meat back when you take it to a butcher. Um, and some of the articles I've read, you know, they talk about aging meat, and basically, uh, you know, it's got to be within a very narrow window. It's like uh, uh, I don't know, 34, 35, 36 degrees somewhere in there. And what it does is actually, uh, uh, I guess, the protein strands they start to break down, so it really tenderizes the meat. It's not rotting, it's not decaying, it's, it's breaking down, it's a natural process, and it takes like over a two-week period. Well, I decided I wanted to try that one time. However, I don't have a cooler where I can control the temperature, and I just took a gamble, and the day that, uh, uh, the day that I killed the deer actually was just above freezing, right at freezing, and it stayed that way for about three or four days. Well, after that, the temperature started fluctuating. I'd get up to 55, but then the next day, boy, it dropped back down, so I thought, oh, I think I'm safe, I think I'm safe. No, no, it's, uh, it, for whatever reason, I guess those days where it got up warmer, maybe stayed warmer for two, three days or whatever like that, it just, it tainted the meat. And I've, you know, I've had a lot of venison and, uh, that was one of those, okay, well, that's the exact lesson, you know, I, I, I knew better. Um, but it, it, it has to do with the care of the meat and then also the quality of the, you know, of the cooking job. Um, you know, I hear a lot of people complain about duck breasts, uh, and uh, I never really had the opportunity to go duck hunting until I became a game warden and got a buddy that grew up duck hunting and he gave me a couple good recipes. And uh, I fixed a whole mess of duck breasts 
for Thanksgiving one year, in addition to the, you know, to everything else that mom was doing. And I had relatives over that would not touch wild meat, you know, but I was straightforward with them. Hey, here's what it is. You know, try it. If you don't like it, you want to throw it away. I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna give you any grief. And of all people, I had an aunt. She took a second helping. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, but it was so. You know, I was real proud of myself. I'm like, this stuff tastes good. You know, <laughs> it's not just edible. This is good. Um, so that's 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 a lot of it too. Um, you know, one interesting thing. I don't know if you've heard about it. It's called the uh, like the locavore <laughs> movement or whatever. Basically, it's eating eating foods that are local. Uh, with the mindset of, okay, you don't have all this expense paid in shipping and everything else like that, and you can you can probably pick and choose organic stuff a little bit easier and everything. You're supporting the locals and everything else like that. So, there you, you've seen a pickup, I guess, in the idea of hunting in in people that normally wouldn't consider it, uh, and that has a lot to do with it. Knowing the you know there's not uh, hormones injected in this meat, this that, blah blah blah, you know all that other stuff like that. So see a little bit of that a movement toward that which you know positive thing might get people in who normally wouldn't yes ma'am i'm going to go way back go ahead go if way someone, back if someone would be interested in um, your profession mm -hmm. what is there a degree a college degree that's necessary and if and so what area um they're pretty illinois every state is different uh, Illinois is pretty liberal as far as that goes. Uh, when I hired on, you had to have the four-year degree. You had to be at least 21. And I think you had to, had, to be able to, had to be able to swim. What they've done now is they've kind of watered that down a little bit. Uh, if you don't have the four-year degree, uh, then it's a two-year degree and three years consecutive law enforcement experience with the same law enforcement agency. Uh, they prefer it be, you know, the degree itself be either in uh, law enforcement or the sciences. Uh, but when I hired on, one of the guys in our class, his, his, uh, his degree was in English Lit. Uh, but he had a very, very strong outdoor background. Uh, you know, so, you know, he qualified. Uh, you know, to me, the most important thing, obviously, other than meeting the basic requirements, is literally for that person to have been an outdoorsman, you know, for a good portion of their life. Uh, hunting, fishing, trapping. I mean, you're not going to cover every single base, but, you know, let's stay to hire some people that aren't, and they're so far behind the curve, one, in understanding the best ways to catch people at doing it, two, understanding when somebody gets involved in a... There are odd situations that can happen when you're hunting. And until you are actually a hunter and you've been in some of those situations or seen your buddy in one of those situations, you know, for somebody to just walk up on it, you got to go, you know what, I know this looks bad, but here's what just happened. Well, you know, it's, it's feasible, it's believable, because you've seen it before. So it, it basically makes you better as an officer with your discretion. Um, to me, that's the most important factor, that somebody who's actually, you know, an outdoorsman. Uh, the other stuff, yeah, it's important. Uh, Communication, I never realized it's an enormous part of the job, uh, both written and verbal. Uh, you know, just in your everyday interactions, to speaking to groups, to writing your field reports, to dealing with the state's attorney. Uh, it's much more important than what I really thought early on. Uh, uh, fortunately, I had a big leg up on it because my dad got rid of our TV when we were young, and so I did a tremendous amount of reading, so I never realized how much that benefit me, you know, on something like this, but it did. Um, so they prefer the sciences or law enforcement, but it doesn't have to be. So Thank you very much. you're welcome. Anything else? Yes, sir. I was talking about that honeysuckle shrub there. <clears throat> yes. If you got a pasture that's uh, got pretty good fencing on, goats. put a couple deer in there. I mean, excuse me, put a couple goats in there. Boy, they will knock that down so yes. fast. Yeah. And I had some that was pretty tall, and they couldn't reach it. So this man, really, I had. He got up there and he pushed it over, and the others were grabbing at it. While they grabbed it, he grabbed down and went on to real fast and grabbed him a mouthful too. Yeah, yeah. I've I've seen I've seen goats climb apple trees and all sorts of stuff. To oh get, yeah, yeah. Get what they can. But yeah. They really, they really love that. They, they uh, they've also used goats. Uh, you know, kudzu. It's a 
invasive vine from the yeah, south. Right, yeah. We have it in southern Illinois in patches. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is, if the landowner isn't willing to allow the state to come in there and deal with it, you know, the state can't can't force them to. Um, but one of the methods, you know, because I'd run into it down south, you know, I'd let the landowner know and then, you know, contact our guy and say, hey, work on him, you know, see if he's willing to let you guys come in and do what you need to do. But one of the, they found that 400 goats can eat an acre of kudzu a day. Wow. And their hooves, uh, you know, just simply from walking around on it and everything else like that, they introduce a bacteria to it that causes issues, you know, with its growth. Uh, so that, that was something I thought, man, what a marvelous, you know, you put up a hot wire fence. Of course, those goats are going to eat everything else, but there's yeah. usually when there's kudzu there, there's not much else. Uh, you know, and so it, the effective way as opposed to, you know, herbicides or, or something else. But so. that shrub is, uh, I think, expanding in other areas now. Oh, absolutely. Because years ago, we used to go up to Pike County up there. My cousin had a farm, so we went up there deer hunt, too. Drive up the interstate, and they had none you can see it up there. Now it's getting thicker. Yep. I was just up in, uh, in Peoria for some training here last week, or two weeks ago, whatever it was, and uh, there was snow down, and the other officer I was with, he said, <clears throat> Gosh, look at this big, beautiful timber. And then he goes, you know what the difference is? I'm like, yeah, there's no bush honey software here. You can just see through it. It was just yeah. gorgeous. Right. But it was all on the edges of the roads. You know, so it's just, you give it 10 years, it'll be through that timber. The only place I've seen that it will not grow are low-lying areas that flood relatively frequently. Right, yeah. Everywhere else, the biggest, most mature timber, sure, it takes it a little bit longer, but it'll still grow in there. They're growing, you know, it, it grows everywhere. You know, I used to think that... Uh, uh, autumn olive or Russian olive, ugh, you know, that's a horrible one. I mean, I helped plant it when I was a kid. You know, we got it from DNR. Yeah. Uh, but it's primarily an open field type plant, but that bush honeysuckle is wherever it gets, it's yeah. going. It really is. Yep. Anything else? I don't know where I'm at. You were right on the money. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's still a ton I didn't talk about. So. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, I have a bunch of fishing digests over here. I only have two hunting digests because we're running low on those. Uh, but I'll give you guys my state cell phone number. If you have generic hunting, fishing, trapping question, do your best to figure it out in the digests, uh, please. If you can't, then that's fine. You know, call me regular hours, ask. Uh, if you see something that you know you're pretty sure the game warden would want to know about it, please call me. If it's serious enough. Uh, you can call me at 2 in the morning. I don't mind. Uh, I pretty much got my phone with me around the clock. And, I mean, unless I'm at church or on a date with my wife, it's pretty well on. I might be out of tower range sometimes, uh, so you can leave a message. But uh, uh, if you want, uh, I can scribble. I should put it up there, I guess. That would have been smart. Uh, but, yeah, if, you're, if you want it, uh, feel free, and I'll, I'll dole it out. So. What is it? Uh, 618. 317-2658. And my first name is Don. And the whatever, Game Warden, CPO, whatever works for you. Um, yeah, feel free to call. Uh, like I said, there's there's a lot that goes on, and it's amazing sometimes when we make a make a good case or something, then the people that have come to you afterwards and tell you that they suspected it was going on. It would have been nice if you told me four or five years ago. <laughs> yeah. So, thank you very much. Right